we want to thank everyone for their patience um, in um, the delay that we had because of votes. We appreciate um, your coming back today. And uh, I like to reward uh, people being on time and uh, doing what they're supposed to do. So I think we'll go ahead and ask Mr. Alford if he now would uh, present his five-minute testimony. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Chair. Alford. Committee chairs and distinguished members of this joint subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to testify today. I am President and CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce, which represents the fastest growing segment of American small business, black owned businesses. At the inception of the NBCC in 93, there were 300,000 black owned businesses doing $33 billion in annual sales. <coughs> Excuse me. Today, there are more than 1.9 million black owned businesses doing over $138 billion in annual sales. This fantastic growth leads to a growing demand for a larger educated workforce. By a study by Stanford University shows unemployment among all teenagers at 24.2 percent. Among black teenagers, regardless of gender, the rate is 41.6 percent. But among black teenage males, the rate is a very dangerous 45.5 percent. Nearly half of that population is unemployed. The percentage of these young people who will be enrolling at the University of Southern California, Ohio State, et cetera, will be a very small, will be very small indeed. The best alternative is proprietary schools. The above is made all the more crucial when we look at the educational axis. The Bureau of Labor Statistics data shows that Americans with less than a high school diploma have an unemployment rate of 14.7 percent. Those with a high school diploma, 9.5 percent. Those with associate degree or certificate, 8 percent. And those with a bachelor's degree, 4.5 percent. We can reach but one conclusion. It should be the primary goal of the Federal Government to provide as many young minority Americans as broad a range of educational opportunities as possible. Why is the Department of Education targeting for-profit schools with a vengeance that will harm a certain segment of our population? The gainful employment rule is a job killer. Incredibly, proprietary schools serve 52 percent of these high-risk students, while nonprofit schools serve only 9 percent, and public schools serve a paltry 6 percent. Furthermore, 49 percent of the students enrolled at for-profit institutions are low income, as opposed to just 18 percent at public schools. Also, 50 percent of the students attending for-profit colleges are minority students, compared to just 34 percent at public schools. So the problem at hand is that minority students are already at a great disadvantage. And now the Department of Education has made it worse by shutting down a major path to education and jobs. The Department of Education has drifted over into a lane reserved for the Congress of the United States, making laws. That the Department has created this rule is harmful enough. The process was definitely flawed, if not corrupted. We want to draw your attention to questions that beg your intervention. We know the secret meetings took place between Department officials and Wall Street short sellers that were placing heavy bets against the share prices of for-profit schools. What was going on? We know that the Department assembled a covert group of allies, including former employers of Department staff, short sellers, and competitors of the for-profit industry, and that they traded secret information against the code of the rulemaking process. The question is, what was going on? We also know that Department officials elicited negative information about for-profit colleges from the secret cabal, and the information was provided even when it was deceptively collected. What was going on? We know that the Department relied heavily on a now discredited GAO report, but never withdrew this report from their process of consideration. What was going on? We know that the Department assembled a biased rulemaking committee composed of a 16 to 1 ratio, meaning that there was no opportunity for the industry and the minority students they represent to have a fair voice in the proceedings. What was going on? We know that the Department was intent on punishing proprietary colleges from the very beginning, even while America's higher education challenges confront every type of institution. So what is the Joint Subcommittee going to do to address student debt? academic performance, and occupational preparation in every college in our nation. In conclusion, the gainful employment rule is now the law of the land and will have grave consequences on hundreds of thousands of minority students. We want to remind everyone that to qualify for public assistance programs, proprietary schools must meet exactly the same academic standards set by the same accreditation agencies as Harvard or Penn State. The fact is, 
that the opponents of proprietary schools are really trying to mask the same concerns that all colleges share, such as student debt, academic performance, and occupational preparation. The black employers that I represent hope you will work together to find solutions to these vexing challenges rather than make a scapegoat out of for-profit schools. The bias and corrupt process which produced this rule should be reversed through the Congressional Review Act or some other means. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions and discussions. I yield eight seconds. You get uh, the star, the gold star. <laughs> <laughs> for not going over your time today, Mr. Alford. Thank you very much yes, uh, for your comments. And again, we appreciate your patience in waiting for us, and we're very happy that Mr. Kucinich has joined us. Um, I'm, I just want to make a couple of comments, brief comments, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and then we will um, take turns uh, as members of the committee uh, asking questions of the panel members. I, I first want to uh, read a statement that was in the letter from uh, uh, Congressman Towns who asked us to have this hearing because I think it fits well into a comment that I would like to make based on Mr. Carnevale's uh, comments. Uh, in Mr. Towns' letter, he says, Mr. Chairman, I know there is good faith disagreement as to whether the GE regulations as written are Right, a right or wrong, needed or not needed, but there is one principle on which we all should be in agreement, and that is a rulemaking that allows non-elected government officials to establish policy and have the force of law must be fair, unbiased, and transparent. And then he asked to, that we have this hearing as soon as possible. Um, Mr. Carnevale, I was very interested. I, I'm a person who's had some experience in higher education, and I was very interested in your comments about um, the need to focus on programs and not degrees. I have long agreed with that. I I've, I've very much agree, I think even more so, that we should focus on skills and not necessarily on degrees. Um, I don't agree with you that regulations make mar markets work better necessarily, but I do think that having information is very important, which is a big point that you made. And it seems to me that uh, if that is true for one sector of higher education, it's true for all sectors of higher education, um, that we need students to have accurate information about the return on their spending or their investment. I don't think government makes investments, but people make investments. They make investments in money and in time. And therefore, I think you made a great case for the fact that if we're going to have regulations like these, they should certainly apply to everyone. So I appreciate very much uh, the comments that you made. Now I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Cortez a uh, question. Um, as you know, the Department of Education recently made a number of changes to the final gainful employment regulation. Do these modifications allay your fears that the regulations are going to negatively impact students attending proprietary colleges? Chairman Women Fox, um, I do believe that the, even with the redefined uh, rules, the, the rule itself is complex, uh, it, difficult to manage uh, from both ends, from our institutional uh, ability to carry the task of identifying and the getting the data correctly. I, I think it's also very difficult from, from the federal side to really uh, able to coordinate the ability to gather all the data and then having uh, a, a matrix that allow them to determine and make decisions for institutions uh, without having all the dots connected. So I, I do believe that the, the rule, although it is more flexible than it was in the original, uh, it still doesn't have the transparency, it doesn't have the connection that is needed for us in the trenches as educators to be able to spend, as I said earlier, significant amount of time gathering data and not concern about teaching and learning and providing the education that we need to our students. 
we had taken significant amount of time at Berkeley College alone to try to gather the, the details that we need by July 1st to be able to comply with some of the rules that just came down. So I think it, the institutions in our sector in particular have been affected by this uh, significant targeted uh, a way in that not all the institutions are treated equally, that it only uh, this G rule is only applied to the uh, for-profit institutions. I think it's unfair and not equitable. Uh, do you want to say anything more about the Social Security Administration data that the Department plans to use? I mean, you touched on it in your comments, and, and we only have about 30 seconds, so let me keep, let you keep that in mind. Absolutely. I, I think it's the, not only uh, uh, the privacy of the data and the confidentiality uh, of Social Security information, but again, the, as I said earlier, I don't see how that database along with the information that is being required is going to be able to be managed in a way that will maximize the ability to make choices by the federal government uh, to, our, uh, to our, our institution's welfare and, and well-being. Thank you very much. Mr. Kucinich, I'd like to recognize you for five minutes. I thank uh, my friend, the gentlelady, the chair. Um, I want to speak about the high default rates at for-profit institutions. Uh, staff, uh, could you put up display chart number two? If it's available. Thank you. Now, according to the February 2011 data released by the Department of Education, defaulters from for-profit colleges disproportionately account for 48 percent of student loan defaults across all higher education sectors. It is also true that 64 percent of the students at for-profit colleges are low-income minority students. Since these students are overrepresented at for-profit schools, they make up the majority of the default rates caused by for-profit institutions. Now, uh, Dr. Carnavalli, some for-profit colleges have argued that their high default rate is due to the fact that they disproportionately serve low-income minority students who are more likely to have financial stresses. Uh, and there is an assertion uh, that that is the reason why you end up with so many defaults. But, but I am just wondering if a more accurate description of defaults is that uh, low-income minority students at these for-profit colleges are more likely to default because for-profit colleges have tuition costs that are in some instances eight times greater than nonprofit public colleges and thereby put those uh, minority students who attend them in greater jeopardy just because of the sheer amount of, uh, of uh, expense and debt that they have to incur. I would like your response to that. The social science on this is interesting um, and somewhat surprising, frankly, to me. We ran these numbers uh, and expected to find, as we did, that there is a disproportionate effect on minorities and low-income students. But when you uh, run uh, statistical tests to figure out what the cause is, what comes through very clearly, uh, and I've, again, it surprised me, uh, was that the cost uh, and the low wage rate is the principal determinant uh, of default. There does seem to be, in some ways, when data. You, you, want to, you want to explain that? When you say cost and a low wage rate, what do you mean? Uh, that is the reason people aren't paying the money back is they're not making enough money to do it, uh, uh, which I know is in some sense logical, but you never expect that in social science. So um, it, it was really very striking in the numbers. That is, people, uh, the fact that people don't repay. Uh, is because they can't repay, uh, and uh, but but I, but you know let's look at another uh, variable here, uh, which is a dependent variable because when you when you look at the fact of the cost uh, of the um, that nonprofit co uh, colleges have for foreign education. Uh, there, there's multiples of that cost as opposed to other colleges. I mean, wouldn't you agree with that? Oh, sure. But one of the things that you may not be making up in a, making up money, 
but the mountain you have to climb of debt is much yes. larger if you are uh, going to a for-profit college. And the size of the debt does appear to have a direct relationship on repayment. That is, people There's, are intimidated by the debt, I guess is the way to say but, it. But let's not miss the connection. The size of the debt comes from the amount of yes. money that people are charged for their education. This is part of this whole discussion that uh, really is sort of a couple horizons away. We're talking about, in the end, in the short haul, whether the programs are worth it, but then there is a question that we haven't really addressed yet, is should the programs be least cost? Uh, that is, you can get two programs that are essentially the same thing. One in a community college will end up costing you eight grand or nine grand, uh, and a for-profit college costs you multiples of that. Should the government be concerned about the cost differential? Well, uh, that really that, hasn't come up much in this debate. Well, it, it's, uh, it's come up now. Yes. You brought and, it up. And I, and I think that uh, this committee is, uh, is the proper form for us to determine whether, whether or not uh, the, the low-income minority students who are experiencing these high rate of defaults are, are in a situation which, where they are boxed in by uh, the extraordinary cost at for-profit colleges. Because you know, when you are coming from a, a, an inner city background, that is where I came from. I can tell you that going to college is like a dream, mm -hmm. and people will do anything to do it, including, Madam Chair, uh, taking on extraordinary expenses and getting over their heads and sometimes putting themselves in a position where they are in debt for the next 10 years or 15 years of their lives. But to the default rate, how do we uh, deal with that? I want to thank the Chair for her indulgence and give me some extra time here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Petri. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Thank all the panelists for the effort that you made to be here today and to prepare your, your testimony. Uh, I had a couple of questions to, of uh, Ms. Carpenter. Uh, first, I wondered if I could give you an opportunity, if you had any reaction to the points made by your fe fellow panelists. I would be interested in hearing them. Thank you very much, um, Congressman Petri. Um, I do have some impressions. As a layperson, a parent, a graduate, uh, clearly I'm, I'm thrilled that there is more public discourse on the topic of educational reform as a whole. Uh, I think it's a vital vehicle by which Americans of all socioeconomic uh, sectors in our society can use to attain their personal uh, pursuit of the American dream. And given my experience in reentering the workforce in a dramatically changed economic environment, transitioning from an industrial age society, a, a more nationally oriented uh, business economy to one that is far more global, more, more technologically advanced, um, clearly we are living in times of transition. Uh, and once again, as I, I stated in my testimony, we are now faced as a nation in addressing the appropriate responses in the educational forum to meet the demands and needs of our society and our economy. So thanks to all of you for giving very, very important consideration to what, what the best reform would be. Beyond that statement, I would really defer to other people who are more professionally um, invested in the, the process to speak specifically to uh, the issue of uh, what is before us for the gainful employment regulation. Uh, I am not as well informed as others on the panel uh, who have given testimony, but clearly they, they have important uh, input yeah. for the, the panel. When we met, uh, and, and you participated in a little different panel uh, in, in Madison, Wisconsin, you indicated that partly because of your your training at Herzig, but mainly because of your work with an international company uh, where you are dealing with uh, 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 hiring and, and evaluating uh, uh, possible employees or current employees all over the world in different uh, high-tech uh, areas. Your company was working computer programming and the like. And you said people 
it was sort of a cry from the heart, if I remember, that people better start f waking up as to what's really going on and not be too self-indulgent and assume that we, well, it, we will just continue uh, because uh, in the future as it has been in the past. Uh, we, I wonder if you could expand on that. Uh, and there, you and other employers who operate not just in the United States but in other countries have a perspective we ought to be learning more about because you're you're dealing with young people who are looking for jobs doing essentially the same thing, but whether they're from India or China or Africa or Europe. And uh, what, what's your perspective on how well we're doing or uh, whether that, that, that assessment is accurate that we're a little self-indulgent here? Um, there are certain skill sets that are in severe shortage uh, within the, the tech sector in which I work. And so, yes, we do um, work with people in multiple countries in, in providing the research and development work that's necessary for my, my company, Quest Software, which is uh, a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ based in Orange County, California. For them to be able to hire enough qualified employees, we do employ people from all over the globe. I personally work on a research and development group that writes enterprise level software. I have coworkers who reside in Russia. China, New Zealand, that I meet with weekly, some, sometimes daily, depending on where we're at in the development cycle. Many of these individuals are working for an American corporation, speaking in a second language. English is our predominant language of business, layered on top of the, the very technical skills they've acquired. Uh, it, it's critical that Americans wake up to realize that uh, in order to be successful in business, you will most likely be doing business with, with people as coworkers from all over the globe. Therefore, our skill set in language skills, cultural sensitivity skills, as well as the technical uh, background is, is really critical for success. And how do we attain those things but through our educational institutions and in, in providing the curriculum and programs that are adept to, to train our workforce and still lead the nation? In, in our economic, economic and workforce development. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Petra. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Your testimony has been extremely helpful. Uh, the thing that I'm, Ms. Carpenter, as I listen to you, first of all, we're very proud of you and what you've accomplished. You're not the person who we are most concerned about because you've done well. It's the ones that don't make it. There's a scripture in the Bible, Jeremiah 15, 9, that says, her son rose while it was still day. And meaning that um, her son sat while it was still day, meaning that there are people who have opportunities and they still have life, but something happens in their life that causes their dreams to die. Those are the people that we're concerned about the sunset while it's still day. And on that note, Mr. Carnival, um, can you, you know, when I look at, um, it says both the Senate Health Committee and the Education Trust have reported that for-profit colleges often have tuition rates much higher than those of local colleges. These uh, for-profit tuitions can be as much as five times that of local community or four-year public colleges. If a student choose, chose to attend Berkeley, Dr. Cortez, a for-profit institution to obtain a two-year associate's degree, it would cost her about $41,400 in tuition and fees. However, if that same student chose to go to the City University of New York Community College in Manhattan, it would cost her $6,496 over a two-year period for the same degree. Um, I want to go to you, Dr. Cortez, and then I want to come back to you, Dr. Carnival. Um, Dr. Cortez, what justifies Berkeley's tuition costing nearly $35,000 more than a public community college? Thank you, uh, Congressman Cumming, for the question. It, absolutely, I think the, the value of, of Berkeley education uh, consists of small classes, uh, faculty who are practitioners in the field. Uh, students who have the ability to get 
a required internship as part of the requirements for graduation, the ability to be placed in the job, uh, faculty, as I said earlier, that are faculty uh, doctorally trained, uh, the ability to have uh, a small groups of students working together uh, in order to engage in their graduation. Uh, but more important, I think, is the ability uh, for institutions like ours in the private sector is about capacity. It's really to look at what uh, President Obama have indicated that. And what do you do for retention? What do you do? <coughs> what do you, you use any of that money that you make for retention? Absolutely. We invest over $37 million back in institutional aid to assist students through scholarships and grants to subsidize the additional money that they don't have besides what they get from Pell or TAP in New York or TAG in New Jersey. So we do invest significantly, not only in our own income, going back to the students, because we know they need it. Mm -hmm. The average salary. But is that, is that what most of these schools do? Well, I can only speak for myself. Right, and that's part of the problem. And I understand that, and I appreciate that. Sure. But, Dr. Because as you described, much of your student population is being at risk. At, at, at risk, right? Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, the majority of our students uh, need uh, significant uh, remedial work. Uh, we instituted, for instance, this coming year, a bridge program that we allowed students to take courses uh, for a period of about five weeks. We don't charge any tuition. It's almost like a trial period. We allowed the students to make sure that they don't get into loans, that they're not paying tuition. But 51 percent of your students take on riskier loans, do they not? I'm sorry? 51 percent of your students take on riskier loans. Is that, is that well, not correct? I don't know if they're riskier. They take loans, but yeah. it, you know, the, the, the difference between what they cannot afford between federal and state aid and the $37 million that we give, that's what the students need Dr. to Dr. Cortez, you understand what I'm saying, don't you? Sure, I do. You understand that we are concerned about people whose dreams are taken away, and then they leave school with two, two bags, one with nothing in it, and the other one with debt marked all over it. And then their dreams are not deferred, but they are killed. You understand that, right? Well, I understand. I, I can't. And it's, a, and it's a whole lot of them. So, you know, I hear people talk about minority students and how they feel so happy that the, all these opportunities. But if you, for every one that graduates, there are seven or eight that's fallen by the wayside. And, and many of says never to return to college. Never. Right. That's criminal. Criminal. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think it, yeah, uh, you know, I'm a product of a public school, New York City education, and, and I'm a product of a community college. Uh, so I can speak from the real life experience. I do believe that what we do in our sector, we take students who are so much at risk, we're able to get students to a point of graduation. I'll give you an example. In the city of, the great city of New York, New Jersey, uh, with the dropping, the high school dropout rates of over 50%. If we can get four students out of 10 to graduate from that great city of New York, we're doing a tremendous service to the city of New York. Because those four students without Berkeley in that vicinity, in that local area, will not be going to college because they cannot go to a community college. They're not going to the private institutions or the publics because there's capacity. Thank you, Madam Chair. And the, and the other six are left in debt. No, they're not. Well, what happens to them? They're not. They either do, do not, they, they not continue. They have to go back to work. Many of them uh, have to exist by working. So the debt is extinguished? No. Many of the students who enter uh, will be able to complete. If, if I give the example of the four that, that graduated, the other six will be able to come back and return and finish their degree if they were able to come back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Cummings. Mr. Meehan. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this, in this hearing today on this. I, I think we all share the concern of trying to assure that the funds that are forwarded to the students are, are repaid, but I'm struggling with the, with the issue here in which we are treating the for-profit institutions in one way, and we aren't really analyzing this same effect in the not-for-profit institutions. Uh, I, for one, have benefited from a number of college students who are volunteering to work in my office because they can't find jobs. And yet, they are tens of thousands of dollars in debt. 
And so if we're going to use a standard, I'm struggling with the, with, with the regulation. We've now come up with rules, and we are going to determine we're going to hold people accountable to a standard. Mr. Carnival, I know you've discussed this a little bit and tried to look at this issue. Is, is, is it fair for us to hold the not-for-profit institutions in a different category than the for-profit if we're making these analysis on a year-by-year -year basis first, and then second, a lot of kids come out, they, 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 they struggle for a year or two, and then they get that first job. I mean, should we be doing this the next year, or should we be waiting three or four years to make this calculation? The regulation essentially uh, gives the institutions four years. That is, uh, so it extends over a, a fairly lengthy period of time, and the calculation um, in terms of loan repayment allows 10 years for AA and some college, 15 for a BA, and 24 selected programs like dental programs and so on. So uh, in that sense, uh, uh, it is not one of the way, uh, I think, especially the amended uh, regulation here, uh, the way to think about this truthfully is the brunt of this is uh, aimed at program improvement. The penalty part of this is very marginal, frankly. It's only 2 percent of the total. It's capped at 5. Um, this is essentially a, a device for moving programs toward uh, higher labor market value is, in the end, what it is. Uh, the other point, and is raised uh, uh, by Mr. Cummins, is that it is true the institutions get three strikes on this. The students just get one. Uh, that is, if you end up uh, with huge debt, first of all, whether you default or not, you're not likely to return to school, and they don't. We know that. And that uh, relates directly to the size of the loan and the wages that the program leveraged that allows them to pay it back. So it matters which program it was. And then uh, the other difficulty for the students is you only get one shot, at, one bite at the apple, because debt doesn't, you, you can't go back and get more debt to go to school. Okay. Mr. Alford, would you respond to this? Because I, I think that I, I have w experienced as I've visited institutions across the range, from community colleges to my universities to some of the schools and, you know, the, 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 the for-profit schools. Many of the students in the for-profit for schools are non-traditional students. In fact, this is one of the real opportunities they have where somebody's reaching back to them and saying, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a skill that you can then take and find a way to gain employment in a very, very difficult market. And what I'm concerned about is the potential that this higher standard may leave a situation where those kinds of schools will say, fine, we are going to now stop reaching back to that student who's the least traditional, who's, who, who's the toughest reach because that's the most likely to fail. Let's just go find the safe middle. Cherry pick. Participate in that. So would you please tell me what your perspective is? Yeah, I think it would have a devastating consequence uh, on, on the people I represent, our businesses who hire, who try to hire people uh, from these communities. Uh, there's two big problems with, our, with my constituents. One is management trainees. Our more successful businesses scour this nation looking for good, educated black talent. Secondly is the labor, the lower level. Drugs can't pass a drug test, and that's a requirement for any insurance policy. So those are the two major problems. And one thing that's unfair too, sir, private for-profit schools have higher tuition because they don't have Uncle Sam and the state government and local governments giving them subsidies, tax-funded money. It's unfair to have a graft that shows all this high tuition, but they don't charge that much. If you put the tax subsidies in there, they'd probably be more expensive than the for-profit schools, playing with numbers. Thank you for making that point, uh, Mr. Alford. Madam Chairman, my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Mr. Brawley. I would like to um, make it clear at the outset that the entire focus of every conversation we should be having about higher education is whether students 
are achieving progress toward a degree at a reasonable rate and whether the federal dollars being invested in any of these institutions meets the expectations of taxpayers who are providing that assistance, whether that is a for-profit college, a nonprofit college, a private college, or a public institution. My nephew has attended a for-profit college, got a degree, and is working in a job that he loves. And the question is not whether there have been substantial successes at for-profit colleges, because, Ms. Carpenter, your very presence here shows that there have been. The question in this environment that all of us work in is whether or not for-profit colleges are providing the type of results for the investment we are making in them. So let's talk for a moment about that. Uh, my good friend, Senator Tom Harkin, has been doing a lot of analysis of this issue in his uh, Senate Help Committee. And as a part of the exhaustive study that his committee has done, there are some troubling findings. One of them is that 63.4 percent of associate degree students at publicly traded for-profit schools and 58 percent of bachelor degree students at these schools drop out within a year and that almost every single one of those students, more than half a million in one year, are left with substantial debt, and that a four-month stay at a for-profit school can leave a student with $4,000 to $11,000 in debt. Now, these are the facts. Even though for-profit students make up only 10 percent of all higher education students, the schools receive 25 percent of federal student aid. Even more alarming is the fact I mentioned earlier that 48 percent of all student loan defaults come from students who attend for-profit colleges. And in many states, that rate is greater than 50 percent. Uh, Mr. Carnival, are you familiar with the data that I've just cited? Do you believe that the, the sector that we're here talking about today, which has done good things by your own testimony, is doing a good job at being stewards of federal tax dollars given those results? I think the evidence is that is, uh, when you get past the anecdotal evidence, and there's anecdotal evidence on both sides, that is, they're wonderful stories. We heard Ms. Carpenter today, and they're awful stories. The data, uh, which is more comprehensive, says quite clearly uh, that there is uh, an issue here with uh, public funds, that is, the government doesn't want to buy planes that don't fly. And in this case, since they, they promise is an educational program to get you a job at a sufficient wage to pay back the cost, uh, in this case, there's a very substantial share of programs that simply don't do that. Uh, and those are highly concentrated uh, uh, in for profit institutions at the certificate and AA level, frankly. Well, and one of the other disturbing things that came out of those uh, findings in the, the Harkin Committee's investigation was that there were schools who were getting a large number of online students, which is great in terms of dealing with changing demands of student, uh, students pursuing higher education, but they had 1,700 recruiters working for those schools and one placement officer. Do you find that troubling? The, I know from um, relationships with particular for-profit institutions that naturally where they uh, see growth in demand, i.e., the um, uh, military, when the mil military benefits went up in the past few years, there was a huge increase uh, in recruiters for military personnel to move to for-profit colleges. In the end, my bias about that is if in the end they get a good education, a good job, I don't care. That's right. uh, but there is an issue here uh, that they don't. And I must say, uh, another thing that uh, no one speaks to here today but should be spoken to, uh, as I went through the uh, college on the GI Bill and so did my two brothers, um, uh, they're not included in this regulation. And one of the dangers in this is if, because it is a private market-oriented institution, it will take its profits where it can. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, so if we shut down uh, using the uh, current regulation, a lot of the uh, expansion in these programs that don't pay among the regular population, there's a risk here that there'll be a shift to the military. And I, I uh, at a, uh, personally, I have a problem with that. Uh, thank you. Ms. Carpenter, you mentioned you worked at Trek Bicycle Company in Waterloo, Wisconsin. And I, I'm from Waterloo, Iowa. You also mentioned the Decorah connection with Luther College. One of the things that's 
concerning to me is that the very school you attended, and obviously got a great education, you're doing great things, and I commend you for that, but Herzing had a dropout rate of 53% for associate degree students and 48% of bachelor's degrees within the first year. Were you aware of that phenomena while you were a student on campus? And what would be your explanation for why those dropout rates were so high? On my campus in Madison, Wisconsin, and within my degree program, I find those numbers not, not to uh, not to sync up with my personal experience. Very few students, if any, dropped out of my associate's degree program. Uh, as a matter of fact, I only had These were Sturz, or Herzing's own figures provided to the Senate Help Committee. So I, I'm just asking right. you whether that was something that you were aware of when you, obviously, it was not. No, not within my degree program and, and uh, for the, the group of students that I graduated with. That was not my experience. And one of the other disturbing things about Herzing's website is there's a link on it to tuition. And instead of talking about the actual cost of attending Herzing, it says, unfortunately, a simple comparison of tuition price won't give you enough information to compare the true cost of attending school. Is it, it all bothersome to you that your alma mater would not be willing to give students who are considering enrolling there an opportunity to make comparisons of the various costs of attending Herzing as opposed to some other school? I don't believe that Herzing withheld that information. They certainly would encourage you to come in and speak with an admissions counselor so that they could clearly identify the value for the tuition that you do pay. I was absolutely well aware as a consumer what the cost would be. One of the reasons that Herzing was a, a true value to me is that it, within my testimony I had mentioned I attained an associate's degree within a year and a half time as opposed to the traditional two years, based on block programming, based on the availability of coursework. Mm -hmm. So I think that Herzing is doing a very intelligent job of allowing themselves the opportunity on a one-on-one -on -one basis to sit down with prospective students and explain how their program is differentiated, how they are different, differently situated and valued, and giving potential students, prospective students, all of the facts to know what will my education at Herzing cost in comparison to other options, other institutions for the same types of pursuits, same types of degree programs. And the onus is on the individual consumer shopping for, for their own education. And I, I think it's an advantage as I, I mentioned, that Herzen gives the opportunity to, to encourage their students to come in and talk about that one-on-one -on -one and not rely on face value uh, information in a website that doesn't tell the whole story. Ms. Thank Carpenter, you. thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Braley, you get the prize for going over the farthest. Ms. Biggert. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank, I thank the witnesses for all for being here and your patience while we had those pesky votes, which seem to have taken an awfully long time. Thank you. Uh, my question, uh, I'd start with Dr. Uh, Cortez. Uh, I went to, you know, gone out to visit several of the schools and gotten some information, but uh, when we start, when this first came up, we were talking about why doesn't dis dis disclosure work? Why, if you want to know how a program works in, in a school, for example, one of the schools I went to, and I, I don't have the numbers exactly, but they were all over 90 percent, and this was their, their uh, school of nursing, and 92 percent of all those enrolled uh, graduated. Uh, Ninety-six percent of them passed the certification test, and 99 to 100 percent of those that had passed the certification found jobs. Now, this, this seems to me that this is a, you know this then gives a, a student in, or a consumer choice on where they want to go, and it you know and looking at the programs rather than looking at the, the debt to income determining whether there's a, you know value. Uh, value to students. Uh, are there, is, is this something that, that you would see that would work, or are there other, other things besides this, the, you know, the, uh, the way that the, the gainful employment has been, uh, uh, I guess, described? And, and is there something else that, that you think would work? 
Thank you, uh, Madam Beggar. The I, I do agree. I think it's all about, uh, to a certain extent, uh, consumer protection uh, that we're looking at. Uh, if you look at Berkeley College today in our website, not only you'll get the full tuition uh, clearly stated, we have every single indicator of graduation rates, uh, debt to default rates. Uh, we have, uh, by degree, each degree, the level of graduation. We, we believe that transparency is very important in our sector. We make clear that we have a, a code of conduct that talks about not only academic excellence and student success, but then we put that information right very clearly uh, that everybody can look and they can compare costs. For instance, in the state of New Jersey, for example, with the lowest, uh, to, we have the lowest tuition increases on, of any of the institutions in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and in fact, we have one of the lowest tuition of all the private institutions in New Jersey, which include, of course, Ber uh, Princeton and, and other uh, private institutions. We have the lowest tuition rates. So okay. we do uh, very clearly uh, look at making sure that our students get the information they need well, to make. One of the things that really impressed me, too, at these schools is how, how they worked with the local businesses right. uh, and, and, what, uh, and what they were able to, uh, so that they were able to find jobs for, for the students and they had a, the, the colleges had a rapport with, with these, uh, with these uh, businesses. Would you, could you address that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we work very closely with the um, industry and the advisory from uh, the corporate sector. Uh, every degree has an advisory board. So that means that for fashion management or for accounting or finance or marketing, we work very closely with the business community for two reasons. We want input to make sure our curriculum is up to date, that we look at the changes in the global economy to make sure that we're training our students to get into the marketplace. But more important, we're making uh, it connections with them in order for our students to get the internships that I mentioned earlier, and also for the ability to get them placed once they graduate. Uh, as an example, someone mentioned that there were only one career placement in some institution. We have over 20 uh, career placements professionals making sure that our students from the beginning, from their freshman experience, all the way up to the senior year, right. they get the level of advice and counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Sure and I'd like to just job. ask, Mr. Before my time, uh, Mr. Alford, would you comment on on this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, I I think our biggest concern, National Black Chamber of Commerce, is the the whole process of this, and the singling out of for-profit schools. Uh, in a nutshell, what we want is fair and a transparent process. And as I learned in the military, uh, leadership 101 is fair and impartial treatment for all. And I think uh, some are getting less, uh, a less evaluation, uh, uh, an unequal evaluation, if I may use that term, uh, than others. And, and it's, it's quite clear. Community colleges have a, a, a lesser graduation rate uh, than for-profit schools, but you don't hear talk about that. Uh, I heard talk about the Senate hearing that quoted the false GAO report, even after it was divulged that it was false. So I, I think there's some, it's not the process that I think that makes this country great. I Thank hope you. I answered you. I agree with you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Miller? Uh, thank, thank you very much. I should go to button pressing school um, uh, for holding this hearing, Madam Chair. And uh, I want to thank the witnesses for uh, for testifying, Ms. Carnavali. I think that you sort of set the stage when you uh, when you talked about the changes in the economy and in the workplace and in the requirements uh, that have taken both up and down in terms of where you would get your degree and certificates and the rest of that. And that's why many of us have been very strong supporters of the uh, of, of the for profit sector. Uh, in, 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 in uh, higher education and believe that they do fill a need for many students, and certainly adult students as they originally started, people who had to work full time and also try to secure an education to acquire new skills or a new job or what have you that they saw 
on the on the horizon. But uh, sort of like the old saying, friends don't let friends drive drunk. Uh, uh, I have a lot of concern about a sector that I've been an advocate for for a very long time in my 37 years on the committee. Uh, that uh, we've got some outliers here uh, that are giving real heartache to the American taxpayer. And uh, 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 you can keep saying, or not you, Mr. Carnavali, but the, the panel and other members can keep saying that somehow this only applies to for-profit. It doesn't only apply for for-profits. For of the 55,000 programs, of the 55,000 programs, as Mr. Hinojosa pointed out, 37,000 are in public institutions and 5,000 are for nonprofit and 13,000 for profit. And for the, for the public institutions, they're there because this is the first president that raised issues about the completion rates of two year institutions, which are abysmal. They're outrageous. But the suggestion that somehow we, this, this is just targeted uh, for for profit. I was one of those that went to the administration and said that their original ruling was, was wrong. But the, but, the, but the point is that uh, this, this is the question. Then the, the, the members of the panel suggested that this high standard, this high standard will force people to leave the field or to, to cut out uh, 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 non-traditional st non -traditional students. This high standard is that 35 percent of your formal student of your former students are successfully repaying the principal on their federal loans in their third and fourth year after they leave the school. When if you use car dealer and you went to the bank and said, "I want to borrow money, but 70 percent of my customers are going to default." I don't think you get a loan from the bank for your used car business. But if you're in this business, 70 percent of your customers might default and you rated you're okay for the taxpayer to put up the money. And you only have to meet that in one out of, four, one out of three years. One out of three years. You get, and there's no penalty until you, know, until you really screw up. And this is a burden that apparently this industry just can't suffer. You know, we're talking about maybe 2 percent of the programs are going to be implicated here. And I suggest, and as I had suggested to the industry, you might want to look internally and think that you've got some outliers here that you should have dealt with, in, with within the associ various associations here. This is not whether we support for-profit schools or we don't, because all of us have had experiences in our own community, in our families, of their successes. This is about what's going on with respect to the taxpayer. Mr. Alford, you asked about what's going on with, with the department and how they came about this, this rule. I just say anecdotally, uh, I don't know, you know, we have an investigation going on what happened with short sellers and not with the Inspector General's office. I'd say that if the Congress had listened to the short sellers prior to the financial collapse, maybe this nation would be in a different place today. But I want to ask what's going on with an institution that says that they're going to double the volume of their private student loans, as Corinthian College did, to $240 million. And they expect 55 percent of their private loan dollars to end up in default. And, the in, and their default rate on federal student loans doubled between 2005 and 2009 to 21 percent. And they recently told their investors, not the public, told their investors that they're going to manage their default rate by pushing borrowers most likely to default into deferments, forbearance, and income-based repayment. I want to know what's going on there. I want to know when Bridgeport education Takes, buys a college, it takes the price of the, uh, the, the, the amount of money spent on education from $5,000 to $700 per student. I know there's, there's great savings in the internet, but at the end of that process, 64 percent of their bachelor's degrees and 64, uh, 85 percent of their associate degree students are withdrawing from that institution. What's going on? Because when they withdraw, they've already given over part of their Pell. They've already given over part of their student loans. Their account's running down. I want to know what's going on when that same institution then, which gets 86 percent of its money from the federal taxpayers, has 30 percent profit and 30 percent on, uh, on marketing. I want to know what's going on at the, at the, uh, at, at the ATI Career Institute in Texas when, when, the, when, the, uh, when, they, when the state uh, work board found that 300 of their employed graduates had no jobs at all and 427 graduates were not employed as the, as the institute reported they were and the state cut off all of their WEA funding but they're still eligible for Pell Grants and for student loans. I want to know what's going on. I want to know what's, when, the, when, the rep, when the repayment rate for four out of five of the profit schools receiving the most Pell Grants on the GI Bill is 37 and 31 percent. I want to know what's going on. It's not a question of whether I support private schools, for-profit schools or not. 
We sit on this side of the dais on behalf of the taxpayers who are on that side of the dais. And that's why we have these inquiries. And that's why we have a rule that probably does not much more than develop a lot of information. And I think it will cause some people swimming at the bottom of the pool to swim a little faster to try to stay off the bottom. Thank but I you. think that's a minimum. That's a minimum that we can, uh, uh, that we can ask as members of Congress on behalf of the, uh, on behalf of the, on behalf of the taxpayers. Uh, uh, you know, you, let me, Madam Chairman, if I just might say, I would just say this. You know, you, we also want to ask what's going on in, in, when Indiana, Illinois, and California and Florida have joined uh, to, to look at for-profit institutions there. Indiana Attorney General uh, asking questions about, uh, uh, about institutions. Florida investigating eight institutions on, on violated the, the unfair business practices. Iowa, student default rates. Kentucky, job placement, recruitment practices. Massachusetts. Uh, recruitment practices and student loan practices. Mr. Miller, as you There's know, there's an obligation as to run this, and I appreciate as you know, you very can, generous with the time, and I appreciate it. You can it. put whatever your comments are in the record, Dr. I've seen Rowe. The record, it doesn't go do so well. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> but I appreciate the offer. <laughs> I think um, I won't give a speech. I'll try to ask some questions. Um, I, 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 I spent, gave a speech already. You don't. <laughs> I spent uh, 24 years in school, not including kindergarten, so I basically overdosed on school, and all in the public school system, um, not in the private, not in the for-profit. And, and uh, Dr. Carnival makes a great point, is the whole purpose is to get an education and hopefully find gainful employment once you leave that institution that will pay. If the argument is here that, it, that it's too expensive to go to school, I couldn't argue with that more. I served as a foundation board president at the college where I attended and helped to raise money to help educate people that were lower income as I was when I went to college. But to give you an example, uh, if, if the gainful employment rule is to be applied to everybody, I looked at, uh, at Georgetown, a great university, just before I came here. $41,000 is a tuition and 58000 to go there for a year. If you get a job teaching school somewhere after that's over, you can never pay that back. Uh, if you're a police officer in Johnson City, Tennessee, where I'm from, you can never pay that back. I had a medical student's uh, dad call me the other day and said, Dr. Rowe, he said, my son has $212,000 in student loans and he's starting his residency and he'll make about $30,000 a year. Just the interest on his student loan is $1,200 a month, just the interest. He didn't have anything left to eat after that. So it's not just for-profit universities. It's everybody. School is too expensive. And I couldn't agree with Dr. Connell. He makes great points. You should go to school to get a job to pay for something. The other thing I think that's a little misleading, having been a foundation board president, is that when you compare the for-profits, the bricks and mortar are not calculated in those tuition fees. All those million, multi-million dollar buildings, as, as Mr. Alfred pointed out, that's not amortized into that cost. So it is in the private tuition uh, that, that is amortized in the cost. Could you point that out? You made a great point a minute ago, is that you're not really comparing apples. Agree with that? Absolutely, Absolutely sir. Yeah, I think that's. I, I, I envision Ohio State, my alma mater, University of Wisconsin, just humongous all paid for by taxpayers. And, and, and Ms. Carpenter made a point of if some students, and these are many of them are not traditional students, in a much smaller classroom setting, your average freshman class at Ohio State or University of Tennessee in freshman English is two to 500 students sometimes watching a video screen. I have a problem with that. And, and it is true when you get into a smaller classroom setting, it is going to cost more money to do that. And I think, Ms. Carpenter, you made a, a tremendous point. Uh, information is key. Uh, so you can go in and make an informed consumer choice. That's what I did when I went to see. My, my, uh, I knew my choice was I, could, I didn't have the bus money out of town, so I knew where I was going to go to school. But it was an informed choice. And I think that's what you did. You made a very informed choice about what your needs were. Obviously, you were not an 18-year-old as I was, 17, when you started college. You had a little more of a, an idea about what you needed to do. I didn't. Uh, and, and graduation rates, Mr. Miller makes a tremendous point on that, is that if you look in our own state of Tennessee where you get a HOPE scholarship to go to college, to junior college, to community college, or to a four-year school, 50 percent of our students in two years don't qualify after that. They lose their HOPE scholarship because they're not succeeding academically. And I, I think it all, if we're going to do this gainful employment rule, 
everybody should have to do the gainful employment rule. I, I don't have any private. If you are going to set standards, and there is no question there probably are some bad actors out there that are not living up and doing what they need to do. But everybody ought to have the same standards in this country. Mr. Alford made that, and thank you for your service to our country, by the way. Um, everybody ought to have to apply with the same rules. Uh, if you if you're going to do that, then private schools should, public schools should, and and for profit schools should. Uh, uh, Dr. Cortez, would you comment on that? Yeah, I, I do agree uh, with you, Congressman. Um, as you know, not all um, for profit institutions are alike. Uh, do you know, for example, that there are only 94 regionally accredited uh, for profit institutions in this country in Puerto Rico? Uh, that is an example of the differences. Uh, Berkeley College uh, is a brick and mortar. We own a building. We pay taxes, local, federal, and state. We invest back in, into our community, into our technology. When you look at our sector, we, we led the sector in technology, in distance learning. Not all our students, uh, most people assume that for profits are all online colleges. They are not. Colleges like ours are 80 years changing lives in the state of New York and New Jersey. And there are many family owned businesses that are for profit that are put a significant amount of money in the, the economic development of the region. In your uh, folders, you have a, a, a report that we put together uh, in New York, Berkeley College, and in New Jersey. We have invested in economic development over $223 million in a given year, both about economic support to the economy, jobs, student expenditures, building, construction. Those are the impacts that the private sector institutions are offering. It also offers uh, access and choice for students, uh, as you did when you chose your institution. The students come to us because they see the flexibility they see the quality of many of our institutions, and they see the ability to get degrees that they cannot have in other places. Uh, in the state of New Jersey, for example, we are the only, the only two institutions that often offer fashion merchandise degrees, and we are one of them. So they, they can't go to the public institution because they are full. Then they come to us, and we do a very good job. Madam uh, Chairman, I want, to, I want to thank the panel for, for sticking around for our votes. I really appreciate you all doing that, indulging us in that. And thank you. You have been a, a great panel. I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. And uh, Mr. Davis? Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. And I also want to thank the witnesses for being here. It seems to me that we are holding a hearing in search of a problem that is not being addressed. And I say that only because the, the rules that have been promulgated, that have been issued, seem to be fair, seem to be balanced, provides opportunity for correction. And I was one of those individuals who urged the Department, as they were having discussions and looking at making new rules, to try and make sure that they took into consideration the needs of all the institutions, because I represent a large number of for-profit institutions of higher learning. I also represent a large number of public institutions of higher learning. So I want everybody to be treated fairly. As a matter of fact, the philosopher Camus is supposed to have said one time that I love my country but I also love justice. And so I love every opportunity that we can find for access to higher education for our citizens. But I also love transparency. I love factual information. I love serious analysis. I love good counseling and information that will help lead individuals to the kind of choices that will not only improve the quality of their lives, but will give them the resources to pay back whatever it is that they owe. Uh, Dr. Cortez, let me ask you. As you know, the continuing resolution that the House leadership offered sought to cut Pell grants for over a million students by approximately $845 per student. 
Some Republicans have recently described Pell Grants disparagingly as a welfare handout and highlighted it as in need of substantial funding cut. How important are Pell Grants to your students? And will a loss or reduction in Pell Grants harm access to higher education for your students and those who attend your institution? Uh, th thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Davis. Absolutely. I think the loss of any funds for the, the students that we serve uh, is going to impact their ability to access and to persist uh, in college graduation. Uh, I'll give you an example. Many of our students sometimes at the, in the middle of the year uh, come to us for additional funding that we could provide as institutional aid uh, in order to pay their books, in order to get transportation to their school, in order to, for them to pay their rent in their homes. They're, we're talking about a students, which I mentioned earlier, an average family income of somewhere around $25,000. So it would be harmful to your Very students. harmful, extremely harmful. Thank, thank uh, you. Let you me move on because my time is about to, to, to expire. Mr. Alfred, let me ask you, and I have had a great time working with you and the National Black Chamber of Commerce, have a great deal of affinity for the work that you do and for your organization, and I thank you for it. Thank you, sir. I, I was struck by your testimony, though, at one point, where you suggest that for-profit schools are the ones that truly are serving low-income and minority students. And so I ask, what about the HBCUs? What about the HSIs? What about the PBIs? What about these minority-serving institutions that are public, are not-for-profit, mm -hmm. and do a great job? Yeah, and, and I support them, and, and they are at capacity. University of Wisconsin, when I graduated in 1970, its enrollment was 3 percent black. Today, 2011, its enrollment is 3 percent black. The University of California system, they, each semester they have fewer and fewer blacks matriculating at those schools. So HBCUs, yes, sir, but they're a small percentage of the potential we have to educate our people. I mean, the largest HBCU is Howard University is 11,000. You get from Southern at, at 10,000, Texas Southern at 10,000, and then you're down to four digits in any of those schools. They couldn't house 40 million, a population of 40 million people whose children need a higher education. I would certainly agree with that and indicate that they still have capacity, though, that is unmet. But let me thank you for your, your answer and thank you for participating. And I yield back, Madam Chairman. Thank you, sir, as always. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Davis. And now I'd like to recognize Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, let me also thank you for holding this hearing. I really, really appreciate you um, moving forward with it. And I want to thank the witnesses for being here and to say that I know that it's been a long day and um, it's been a tough day for many of us in terms of conflicts. But the point is that um, I'm happy that you're here. And let me just say that as I listen to some of my colleagues, you know, uh, I'm sort of wondering are they thinking about the economic situation that we face across the board? The top universities in this country have people that are now unemployed. And um, because of the fact there's just no jobs. And I think that sometimes you know, when we look at things that, uh, you know, we sort of forget about that. When you look at the top universities, people coming out, no jobs. And then we look at the, um, uh, the situation that we discuss in terms of gainful employment, and then we sort of ignore the fact that there's going to be some problems there when it comes to jobs as well. Um, let me start by saying I support a fair balance process. Uh, I really do. Uh, and of course, um, I support a fair balance process and I support a good, good government and I support educational choice. But I do not support poor quality institutions. I do not support predatory practices. And I do not support a regulatory process that is not transparent. 
I believe that the Department's rules leave many bad actors still capable of harming students. I also believe that the Department's rules may adversely impact many quality programs and in turn hinder educational choice for minorities. First, in the family college attendees and economic disadvantaged students. But I also think there's some other areas that we need to look into. You know, when you look at some of these athletic programs, and, and it's known that there was one university that went for 10 years and did not graduate one basketball player. I mean, nobody wants to talk about those kind of things. I mean, let's look at the, the real issues of education if we are serious, you know, across the board, rather than just sort of looking at one thing and picking on it and staying with it. You know, um, I, I'm also not certain that the process which the department came to the rule was entirely fair and balanced. I'm not convinced of that. I heard some of my colleagues saying it was fair and balanced. I'm not sure of that. There are a number of aspects that are currently undergoing review by the IG yeah, of the department. And until we have the final report, how can we say? We won't be able to say it. I don't see until we get that information. So uh, I'm just sort of cautioning my colleagues. Um, Mr. Alfred, let me just sort of raise this with you um, very quickly. I share your concerns regarding the disproportionate impact that this regulation will have on minority students, as well as your concern regarding the process by which the regulation was crafted. I agree with many of my colleagues here today that there are numerous good things being done by career colleges, though I also agree that there are a few bad actors in the mix. Some are citing examples of, you know, of questionable recruitment practices, and I've heard all of that, uh, and low retention rates. You know, however, we need to look at that also with the economic situation. You know, if you're in school and then you have an economic crisis you know, in the family, what are you going to do? You're going to drop out. I mean, so I think that sometimes we, we're just looking at these things and uh, mm -hmm. we're sort of looking at them with tunnel vision. And I don't think we can do that. I think that we need to look and highlight in terms of a lot of people that, as a result of these institutions, have been able to go on and live a very decent life and make a major contribution to many people. And I think we should not forget that. So, Mr. Alpha, what do you suggest that we do, real, real quickly? I, I think we need to go back and review this in a fair and transparent process, one that's open. I, I, I think when a short seller writes uh, an article, subprime goes to college, and he's talking about the gainful employment rule, how they're going to make this happen, and they're going to make big money. I think something's wrong with that. And that same individual can go into the inner circle of a federal agency and talk to executives of a federal agency and make suggestions. I'm talking about Mr. Eisman, that is, it stinks, and something should be done about that. I think. I think we need to go back and punt and reevaluate this. Right. My time has run out, Madam Chair, and I would like to just ask uh, unanimous consent that the statement by Mr. Alcy Hastings from the <coughs> State of Florida that his statement be included in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. I, Town. Back. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate you holding the hearing, and I apologize for arriving uh, so late. Another committee I was on had a markup. Um, but this is an issue that I am very interested in. Um, let, me, let me start. Um, Ms. Carpenter, I, I read your, your testimony. I found it very moving, and I congratulate you and Herzig University on, on doing such a good job. Uh, there was one particular statement that you made that I just want to highlight. You say, my associate's degree from Herzig University has proven to be of high value to me and my employer. My employment history with Quest Software is but one example that proves that fact. I, I know you know this, but I think it's important to say for the record that if such a statement could be made even in much more modest form by your fellow graduates, Herzig University or any other university that graduates students who can say that has absolutely nothing to fear from this regulation. Nothing. 
So congratulations. I'm glad your experience went well. And what this regulation is designed to deal with, as, as Mr. Miller said, are the outliers, not those who are doing the work of providing access uh, to a higher education and to help people get the American dream. And I'm, I'm glad you're, you're on your path to the American dream. I want to pick up on where Mr. Miller uh, is questioning what uh, was. This regulation, in my view, and I was one who uh, urged the department to withdraw the first first pass at this. I felt that it was, it was an unfair regulation, um, and I, I, I frankly applaud the Department for going back and having several iterations of this. And, and um, I, I won't engage you, Mr. Alford, on whether or not the process was transparent, but I think reviewing 90,000 comments, uh, I think that's something that uh, is, not, uh, is not to be taken lightly. But here's the environment in which we're in. This regulation says that if 35 percent of an institution's former students in years three and four of their repayment status make at least one payment, that is an institution that is satisfying the gainful employment regulation. I find it impossible to believe that someone consider that, can consider that regulation to be an onerous or arbitrary or unfair regulation. And let me put it in the context that we are in. Here's the context that we're in. The budget resolution that passed the House of Representatives, if it were to ever take on the force of law, let us hope it does not, would cut the Pell Grant maximum to $3,000, from $55.50 to $3,000. If we don't act, we will have no Perkins loan program come 2014. H.R. 1, which frankly, f uh, thankfully will never take on the force of law, eliminated SCOG. So here's, here's the Republican vision of Title IV student financial aid programs. No Perkins, no SCOG, a $3,000 Pell Grant maximum, and work study at its current level. That's the Republican vision. That's what they voted for. Now, I ask you, in that context, how long do you think the Federal Government will be willing to guarantee $90 billion a year of student loans if in years three and four we consider it onerous, impossible to achieve, of, of a 65 percent default rate in years three and four? I would suggest to you that, 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 that the, the underpinning of the finances of the for-profit sector and, frankly, every other sector, which is the Guaranteed Student Loan Program, we are not going to be able to count on that Guaranteed Student Loan Program if we are looking at that level of default. And yet that is, in fact, what this, what this regulation contemplates. So I would urge anyone who is taking the position that this is, is um, somehow excessive to, to assess it in that context, because I think all of us have the same goal here, which is to see to it that students of modest means get a chance to go to college. I am a former college administrator. I am a former financial aid director. I have spent my entire adult life dealing with the issues of access and affordability. They mean a great deal to me. And I am very fearful that if we are not careful, careful stewards of taxpayer money, then that money is going to go away. And so I view this regulation, frankly, as a modest means of the Congress and the administration discharging its responsibility to be careful stewards of taxpayer money. So I, I just would ask you to look at it in that sense. Let me, let me then go to, I'm sorry, my time has, has expired, Madam Chair, and I, I appreciate your indulgence. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Bishop. I, I will point out to you a, a note that um, Congressman Rowe has just handed to me that um, points out that in 2006 the amount spent on Pell Grants was $12.4 billion and the amount scheduled to be spent on Pell Grants for 2012 is $49 billion. Um, Would the gentlelady yield? I, let, let me go on to the next. I'm just putting out a fact there for you. I was going to put that fact in context. Okay. Let me, uh, if I could, let me uh, recognize Congresswoman Speer. Uh, I'd like to finish this up no later than 2 o'clock, if at all possible. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of the witnesses who are here. Um, again, we all apologize for 
the frantic pace that we operate under, it doesn't make a lot of sense from time to time. I think this is a very important hearing. But I have to tell you at the outset, I think what the um, Department of Education has recommended is embarrassingly small. I would challenge any of my colleagues to go back to their districts and say to their constituents that we are funding many for-profit colleges at 90 percent. Now, mind you, if we are funding you at 90 percent, you are government schools. The University of California is a public institution and the funding from the state is less than 20 percent. But you are for-profit schools and 90 percent of your money in some cases is coming from the Federal Government. And I might also point out that in one of the colleges that was um, highlighted, Bridgepoint Education, 29 percent of their spending in 2010 was for marketing and 30 percent was for profit. So only 40 percent of the money at that institution was spent on students. I would challenge any of us to go back to our districts and say, this is good government. This committee is about dealing with waste. And I would suggest to you, as Mr. Bishop did earlier, that if you can't make this, I mean, this is embarrassingly low as a standard. And if you can't make these standards, then you shouldn't be in business because, frankly, you are government-operated institutions. You are funded by the government. And if you can't make these very modest um, standards, then you shouldn't be in business. Now, here is where I, my concern is. This reminds me of the financial meltdown. This reminds me of subprime loans. This reminds me of the same institutions that targeted low-income people for subprime loans to get into loans they shouldn't get into, and then they went belly up and the country went belly up. One of the institutions um, has said that it is looking at student profiles for recruitment, welfare moms with kids, pregnant women, recently divorced, low self-esteem, vocational rehabilitation, experienced a recent death, physically and mentally abused, drug re rehab, fired or laid off. That is the target population that some of these institutions, these foreign profit institutions, are seeking um, candidates from. Now, my concern is, since these, re these actual standards don't apply to the military, to veterans, guess what is going to happen? We are going to have some outliers, I am not suggesting that you are, but some outliers going out and targeting our veterans. And we have already had cases. Frontline recently um, did an evaluation and um, actually said to a Marine sergeant who uh, was enrolled at the Art Institute, told the recruiter they suffered from PTSD and was ensured that the college had special tutoring programs for veterans. And he later flunked out of his photography degree program for being unable to finish the work and receiving no help from the college. Or former Marine Wade Cutler and Guardsman Brad Seliga, also in the frontline report, who were hired by Ashford University specifically to recruit fellow veterans, both of whom quit in disgust with the way veterans were being suckered out of their GI Bill benefits. Now, my question to Mr. Carnavali, do you think that we are going to see a um, engagement now by these for-profits to focus on veterans because they are not going to be subject to these modest standards that are being uh, suggested by the Department of Education? Well, I don't want to make this a character assault on people who run these institutions, but I used to run for-profit operations, and I can tell you I would. Uh, that is, um, I would uh, go after the populations where the money was and the regulation wasn't. In the end, I have no problem with that. My problem would be what is the outcome? And unless we start judging these things by the outcome, it is good that for profits chase after uh, abused women. If they serve them, that is fine. Uh, and that is what I think this regulation does. It demands that we use outcome standards to judge uh, 
uh, the, the use of public funds uh, efficiently. And if we don't start looking at efficiency in post-secondary education, there's going to be no more equity because we can't afford it. Um, I might also thank you, um, Mr. Conavale. I might also point out that the University of Phoenix received over $84 million in post-GI Bill benefits, um, and it increased its recruiters to the military um, from 91 in 2003 to over 452. So I am putting word out to all the for-profits, um, I am going to watch what happens to the profiles of veterans in your programs, because we need to protect them. And we are not going to have them waste their great GI Bill benefits on institutions that don't deliver. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Spear. And you, of course, can put anything in the record that you would like. Ms. Waters. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I am very appreciative for uh, you allowing me to take part in this hearing today. I have a long history uh, dealing with uh, private post-secondary uh, private schools. I come from the California State Legislature, where I created a whole body of law uh, relative to uh, private post-secondaries and private uh, schools. Based on my experiences in uh, South Los Angeles, I ran uh, job training programs there, and I watched the recruitment methods. I watched the, um, the uh, kind of messaging that was done uh, by many of these uh, private post-secondary institutions and private colleges. Uh, where they raised the hopes and dreams of a lot of poor people uh, uh, who certainly did not realize uh, any uh, careers or real jobs from uh, the Pell Grant money that um, they allowed to be spent in these institutions. Uh, and it was disheartening. And that's why I've spent so many years on this. I do believe that um, this potential scandal is going to be bigger than the subprime housing meltdown scandal, uh, where uh, many of our homeowners were tricked into mortgages and loans uh, that resulted in uh, foreclosures. Um, I have, over the years, involved myself uh, with any number of these institutions, Corinthian, ITT, Kaplan, on and on and on. And the record is replete with uh, what they have done. I take particularly exception to this uh, messaging that talks about how well you are doing for minorities and how, if you are not offering opportunities for minorities, they are not going to be able uh, to be educated or to have careers or jobs. Uh, I think, Mr. Alfred, you stated that gainful employment regulations will harm minority students. But students attending these institutions are already being exploited. Students at for-profit institutions represent 12 percent of all higher education students, 20 percent, 26 percent of all student loans, and 46 percent of all student loan dollars in default. How would you propose that we protect these students from being saddled with debt and low prospects for job opportunities? And how is it that um, these very, very mild conditions of gainful employed that was employment that was just described uh, by Ms. Spear uh, is going to harm uh, the, uh, the private uh, school industry? Mr. Alford. I have a lot of relatives that uh, have grown up in your district, and those who received education, uh, many from for-profit schools, are doing well, uh, raising families, and living prosperous lives. Those relatives of mine, around 73rd in Hoover and going further into South Central, who did not receive education are either dead in jail or on welfare. Education is the key. So I don't think hurting an opportunity, a vehicle to educate someone, is a productive thing to do. I don't know what you just said. Um, I was listening for some facts. Uh, I thank you for sharing with me uh, that little um, 
than you had about what happened in the It was real, ma'am. It's real. But you have no facts. Uh, so it does, it does not resonate uh, uh, at all. Um, I want to ask a little bit, uh, well, I have something here. I understand there's been a lot of talk about um, the rulemaking process. I would like to submit the list of program integrity negotiators for the record. The negotiated rulemaking included several different types of stakeholders, all of whom stood to be impacted by the rule. The following communities of interest were represented. Students, consumer advocacy organizations, two-year public institutions, four-year public institutions, private nonprofit institutions, private for-profit institutions, college presidents, admissions officers, business officers, financial aid administrators, regional accreditators, uh, national accreditors, uh, workforce development officers, lending community representatives, test publishers, and state higher education officials. I would like to submit that to the record. Uh, Without objection, Ms. Waters, and I, I will point out to you that your time is up. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. I am sorry I was not, Madam Chair, able to get into uh, all of this discussion about short selling uh, because I really do want to reveal uh, something about um, what is taking place in that whole area. I yield back the balance of my time. Feel free to um, put other pieces in the record. We have all done our best to express our appreciation to the members of the panel uh, for the disjointed hearing that we had today. Um, we appreciate your being with us on a Friday afternoon. Uh, some of you came from long distances, and we understand the hassle of do coming here to uh, Washington uh, any time, but particularly when you come from long distances and you I don't know if you're going to try to get away on a Friday afternoon. But we do want to thank you very much for coming, and I uh, hope you will return sometime under uh, a little more relaxed situations. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>